Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us here today and spending a portion of your day with us to talk about this very interesting, very important, and I think it will wind up being an exciting conversation. Uh, managing risk in the pursuit of innovation and making sure that you have your innovation strategy aligned with your business objectives. And sort of the, the subtitle, if you read the agenda is um, in, is to try and get um, to try and make sure that you also have the ability to talk in terms that your CFO and others, the business decision leaders can understand what it is that you're saying. So that's always a big topic that we talk try and talk about here and we're going to hit that head on today. So thank you for joining us here. So when, whenever we have this conversation with Ray and I've known Ray for years, I always leave learning something. And uh, Ray is located in Dublin, Ireland, and uh, he's the author of Billion Dollar IP Strategy. And most recently, he's authored a book on the post-pandemic innovation, and he's written uh, extensively on what it means to communicate to executives and IP for executives. So this is straight away in his wheelhouse. So Ray, let's get to the agenda and what we wanted to talk about. Don't need to go through this. This Everybody's already seen this when they signed up. But when we talk about managing risk, innovation, communicating in-house to make sure that the ships aren't just passing in the night, let's just jump right into it and see where it goes. We uh, we have the, the hour with Ray. So if you have any questions for Ray, please uh, send them and we'll, we'll weave them in. So this is really going to be a conversation about uh, innovation strategy with with uh, with Ray today. So Ray, you wanted to start here with this. This is um, a study recently published or recently conducted by Ocean Tomo, uh, and and the the graph kind of illustrates something uh, rather interesting. Yes, um, this graph I'd say would be familiar to a lot of people on this call. And to a certain extent, it's become a cliche. You know, like we've seen it growing from 1975 to 2005 when this was originally published and it's been updated to the 2015, 2020 as well. Um, and one of the conclusions that people draw from this is that intangible values, time has come. And very often they jump to the conclusion that intangible value then means patents. So patents, time has come. And a further conclusion of that is that this data now validates the activities of chief intellectual property officers. And we're insisting that all of the executives should be listening to us because this is important and they just didn't know it was important. And I think that that analysis and those conclusions are missing a lot of things. And the first thing I think is that if you, if you want to justify why do executives who are not uh, imbued with the religion of intangible value. Um, why do they behave the way they do? And why are they not interested in what we talk about? <laughs> That's a great question. I mean, I, I've always wondered that because if you look at how much IP and intangible value is in these companies, it, it's an overwhelming amount. And, and they, they seem to not have any idea about what it is that we do. Yes. And if you look at the growth of intangible value, um, people might say, well, that was, you know, there was a natural growth in the S&P 500. But I did another analysis on these numbers. And if you look at the tangible part of this, from 1975 to 2015, the tangible value grew seven times. So there was an underlying growth in the tangible value in the S&P 500. But the intangible part grew 175 times. So you can see that, that in comparison to the growth of the tangible value, the intangible value was remarkable. Mm -hmm. And when you say remarkable, it means people are remarking on it. So I went back and looked at this, are people actually remarking on this? And I looked at, at Google Trends. And if you look at the Google Trends for intangible value, there is almost no discussion of intangible value increasing from 2004 up until now. So even though we think this is remarkable, nobody's remarking about it. Yeah. You know, and, and that is something that is always really shocked me. Um, you know, one of the things that I was talking to Ray Nairo about right, right before he uh, untimely passed a few years ago was at what point in time 
do shareholders get involved? Um, and where are we going to start to see the shareholder suits against these companies? Because so much of their value is in innovation and intellectual property and in, intangible assets. And the people who are running these companies don't know, in many instances, the first thing about that which has the most value for the company, and in many cases are doing things that are absolutely detrimental to the company. Yes, well, the difficulty, and it's hard to blame the executives because the training that they received, if you think about the executives, a lot of the companies, a lot of them have um, the formal training that you'll get for an executive will be an MBA. Mm -hmm. And most of the MBA course material is stuff that was laid down before 1985. So most of the MBA material is almost unchanged since what they were learning about management in the 1950s. So they've learned how to manage the tangible and then they hope for the best for the intangible. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the difficulties. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I guess, you know, like, um, and this came up in yesterday's webinar, and I was joking around where um, M Microsoft said, you know, not all the value is in patents. And I said, well, of course it is. I'm a patent attorney. So all the value is in patents. You know, we, we joked around about it. And it's, you know, if you are a hammer, the world looks like a nail. Um, yeah. But that, that's that's not always true. Yes. And, you know, while I have a deep passion about patents, I spend my time talking about intangible value. I don't talk about patent value. And often when I talk about intangible value, a lot of the comments that will come up will be from people who are involved in patent valuation. Mm -hmm. And they'll put a comment there and then they say, for a patent valuation, click on this link. And that's not what we're talking about. A right. patent valuation is one way of measuring one part of your intangible value. And even that part is very contextual. Mm -hmm. But that isn't the answer to the question. Right. And and it also depends upon the company, right? I mean, you know, like obviously Walt Disney Company, for example, they have a patent portfolio, but I don't yeah. think anybody would say that the Walt Disney Company's patent portfolio is what drives their value. I mean, what drives their value is was Mickey Mouse and everything that's come after Mickey Mouse that's been copyrighted. Yes. So you've got copyrights, you've got trademarks. You've got um, just the general reputation, the feel of it. You know, things like even Disneyland and how Disneyland is laid out. Mm -hmm. um, all of those experiences, those are all intangible experiences. So, so Ray, let, let me ask you, I mean, you, you look at this and you say, and, you know, we were sharing in the green room. I'm cascading my thoughts because it's, you know, these things, they come so fast and furious right. sometimes in my head. But we were sharing in the green room a story that from when I was in law school at Franklin Pierce, um, we had uh, a vice president, and I can't remember the gentleman's name. He was vice president from Coca-Cola at the time. And he came and he spoke and he said, and this is, this is 25, 30 years ago, um, that overnight every tangible piece of property that Coca-Cola had could burn to the ground and be incinerated. And they would, in the morning, have more cash than they could ever need to rebuild everything. Uh, and banks would be falling all over themselves to loan Coca-Cola money simply because of the value of their trademarks. And all, that's all they would have to pledge. And, you know, so value comes in a lot of different areas. So, I mean, that's one thing. And you have a bunch of companies that really get it. You know, obviously, Coca-Cola is, is, is one of them. And there's many that do. But then there's a lot of companies that don't seem to get it. And I wonder where on the spectrum the responsibility lies with the board of directors. And, at, and and I get what you were saying about these people came up, you know, Wharton School Business or wherever, at times when intellectual assets didn't matter, it was the tangible assets. But how do we turn this aircraft carrier around? Well, another conclusion of this chart that we have here from Ocean Tomo is that not just the market value, but you can also assume that if the value of these companies has increased to the extent that 90% of the value can be intangible, you can also look at the risk and say that probably 90% or a very large percentage of the risk in your company is intangible risk. Mm -hmm. You mentioned about the valuation of Coca-Cola, but if you, even if we do think about um, things like technical companies that maybe their value is in their patent portfolio, their know-how, um, they can lose their IP. They can lose that value through legal challenges, they can lose them through um, theft, 
through somebody departing the company and a valid employee uh, who mm -hmm. has got this know-how just walking out of the company. Um, so there's lots of ways that they can actually lose this value. Right, right. So there are huge risks that they can, and if you put it the other way, you can lose 90% of your value and still have the buildings and the machines and the cars, but they're not worth anything to you if 90% of the company is decimated. Right. So.